Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower, and I am joined with my good friend, straight from Houston, Texas, Rabbi Stuart Federo. Hi. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend, author yeah. of Judaism and Christianity, a contrast, oh, available you. in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Here's Portuguese. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's the Spanish. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and the English. Nice. Very, very nice. Right. And um take a second to plug my new ebook, which also has physical copies now. I was reluctant to do so, but I had family members oh, that absolutely didn't want to read it on the phone. So I made Let it. Let me see book. one. Yeah, I only I only got one for my grandmother. I have more coming in, but it's with her. So when I when I get Steve, it back, I'll show you. Steve, my first one. Mm -hmm. Okay. My first book went mm -hmm. to Marcy. Went to Marcy. Nice. Yeah, I went to my grandmother. You know, it's what we have to do. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and uh but the print's nice and big. The it's actually eight and a half by eleven, so it's the size of a sheet of paper. Right. So nice, nice and big. Um but yeah, also available in Portuguese. So if you want a copy, uh the link will be in the description for the physical copies and send me an email. If you want the ebook, um, you is a published Arthur. I am Arthur. You, you are. <laughs> you is. You is a published Arthur. <laughs> but Rabbi, today we're going to talk about sacrifice. Is it necessary? Can humans be sacrificed? A, a lot of different uh, routes we're going to take this show yeah. in today. Okay. And uh, then, based on your questions, here's the whole show. No. Okay, yeah. we're done. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Coming through okay? All uh, right. Yeah, it looks fine. So, number one, first and foremost, what exactly is a sacrifice? Uh, what was it? What? Me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I actually recently went, because I've been having some discussions with family members um, to kind of put like the sacrificial system in in like terms they can understand, you know, because they've been so polluted with the Christian Bible and what that is and what they yep. what they propose. And I always say, you know, as a Christian, when you go to church and they bring around the offering plate and you put money in there, how is that any different than when a when someone from Israel came to the temple with some of their live stock, right? Yep. And brought it to the temple and it was basically a way that it could sustain the lives of the priests. You know, you're sustaining the life of your pastor by dropping a few dollars in that plate. It's a sacrifice out of your pocket. Exactly. It's something of yours yeah. that you are giving up. Exactly. And that's exactly for, what the offer system quite is. Quite a few reasons for that. Sure, sure. Exactly. You know, social and, justice. And by the way, social justice. There's, there's another kind of sacrifice too, and that is hearing that your church, synagogue, temple, mosque, whatever, uh, needs carpentry work. Yeah. And so you go spend, give up mm -hmm. your your time, your skills, your effort. Mm -hmm. That's a sacrifice too. Sure. And on the converse, and we're going to get into all these examples, but um, for a Christian, if they're putting that money into the plate begrudgingly and, you know, with without, you know, just doing it because they feel like they have to and they don't want to and so on and so forth, I think most Christians would agree that that's not the right way to do things, right? That you should be a cheerful giver, Right. And you should, you should. Okay. And. But what I'm saying is, because we're going to get into that, the, the offering of the wicked is an abomination and so on and so forth, that if, if the giving up, if you're not doing things in the proper way with the proper mindset, there's, there's some issue there, you know? Well, there would be in Christianity, but, you know, here we, here we, here we go to motivations, okay? And Judaism is a very practical, practicable oh, of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. religion. 
And so if, if some, if they, let's say a, a, a synagogue or church or whatever has a uh, request for money to be mm -hmm. donated to go to a poor family. Sure. And somebody, you know, takes money out of their pocket and very begrudgingly and angrily puts a hundred dollars in the plate. Do you think that the poor family is going to say, Oh, we don't want that hundred dollars because it <laughs> wasn't given. No, of course not. Of course. Exactly. Not. The point is, is help the poor. Right. The point right. Is, is it better to give not begrudgingly? Is it better to give happily? Yeah. But you know something, the poor, the recipient, they don't care. Right. And by and large, I mean, there's there's a lot that goes into this. Okay. And it was a bad and perhaps it was a bad example on my part. And my well, I'm just my saying point that wasn't clear it's... because I get what you're saying, and it wasn't exactly what I was trying to say. Right. For example, the offering had to be brought as basically like I want to say a physical, a physical sign of one's penitent heart. Well, and but, if you but ah, but see, that's the key. Yeah. A sign of a penitent heart. Right. So it's the penitent heart that gets you forgiven. Exactly. Not the exactly. Exactly. And that's kind right. of what I was getting at. But that's right. not thing in Christianity to begin with. So, yeah. and like I said, we're going to get into these. Yep. But um, yeah, right. it's so basic first, definition for sacrifice for you. <laughs> well, I think that's where we had to start. And 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 by the way, this is a conversation, not a lecture. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So your first question, or whatever it was, about humans. The Bible is explicitly clear and says this in numerous places. Here's the main one, the big one, Deuteronomy 12, verse 30 and following. Deuteronomy has a lot in it that says, to the is God speaking to the Jewish people? Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you've been rubbing elbows with each other, wandering in the desert for 40 years, the wilderness for 40 years, but now you're going to start rubbing elbows with pagans. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, by going into the promised land, don't become like them, don't do what they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's an example take heed to yourself that you be not snared by following them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you inquire not about their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods that I may also do likewise? You shall not do so to the eternal your God, for every abomination to the eternal which he hates. Have they done to their gods, for even their sons and their daughters, they have burned in the fire to their gods. Right. So if you okay. read that at, at face value, it's it's showing the way they worship their gods is a way he hates. The things they do is he hates. An abomination is something he hates. And right. what is it that they do? Human sacrifice. Sure. But when I read that, it almost seems like, so you have this initial, the things he hates, and then it seems like human sacrifice this is the worst one out of them all. You know what I mean? Absolutely. When you read it that way, it really it really seems that it's like, you know, they do a lot of bad things. God hates them all. But here's the, the main <laughs> here's one. the big one. Yeah. And yeah. Steve, if you read later, I, I I I think it's Joshua. Okay. It's pretty clear in the Hebrew scriptures that the reason the people living in the promised land lost their land is because they were killing their kids for their gods. So God <laughs> says, you know, don't become like them. Don't do as they do. Don't worship me the way they worship their gods by killing their sons and daughters. Yep. Oh, wait, I changed my mind. Now it's going to be my son whom, whom you're going to believe saves you. <laughs> yeah, that's what, yeah that's what exactly. That's what humanity says. Mm -hmm. So God, God calls human sacrifice an abomination and something he hates. Right. By the way. Christians will say, oh, but read carefully. Their sons and their daughters, they have burned to the fire of their gods. So if a, and I've heard this, I've literally heard this. So if a person sacrifices somebody else's child, that's okay. I, I'm just telling you what they'll say. <laughs> okay. Well, I think um our next our next passages are going to uh debunk even that, that even that uh yeah stupid stupidity stupidity yes <laughs> all right so yeah all right isaiah 66 1 thus saith the eternal the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool where is the house that you built for me 
and where is the place of my rest? For all those things has my hand made, and all those things have been, says the Eternal. But to this man will I look to him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. And where in that does it say anything about it? And he who kills an ox as if he slew a man, he who sacrifices a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck, he who offers a meal offering as if he offered swine's blood, he who burns incense as if he blessed an idol, for hmm. they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. Hmm. I also will choose torments for them and will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. And we've spoken about these passages before. Oh, yeah. And what it's showing is, as we saw in 1 and 2, um, God's really saying, like, what good is the temple if you aren't coming with a prayerful, broken, contrite spirit? You can bring all the offerings you want, but if they aren't done with that penitent heart, that repentant heart, it's like you're offering a person. It's like and, you're bringing and, a dog, offering swine's blood. <laughs> and what it means is that a person who truly repents, if they bring a sacrifice— it's supposed to be indicative of being a changed person. Exactly. I wouldn't even exactly. think to do that anymore. Exactly. Right. Which, you know, we, is a high holiday season theme of the, yes. of the yes. uh, season. So. But yeah, you, you read there in verse three, their soul delights in their abominations. Well, you have to understand that the beginning of verse three would be what the abominations are, right? right. Um, killing a person. Every Jew would have known that's an abomination. Offering a pig, that's clearly an abomination. So when people yep. say that human sacrifice, especially that of Jesus, is okay, like, have you even read your Bible? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, what were we saying before about uh, only reading what they validates their already existing belief system? Sure. Yep. Sure. And I don't know about you, but I really think this this area of Isaiah 66 kind of like puts Christianity to bed, just like Deuteronomy 12 does. And people just completely overlook it. Well, because it's, it's, it, it is not as clop you over the head. Sure. Okay. I mean, it's, yeah, you have to use your brain. You have to be able to a read little bit the more poetry. Subtle. Yeah. And the, the go-to verses that people have tend to be the ones that are kind of obvious. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It, when, he, when God calls a uh, human sacrifice, an abomination is something he hates. You kind of can't get around that. Right, right. So, but this, he who kills an ox is as if he slew a man. Well, I never kill an ox, so I'm okay. <laughs> no, no, that, I'm telling you. Yeah, it's, it's, I hear, I, I hear. Yeah, yeah. But it's one of those things, as you always say, that uh, a text without context is a con, right? So yeah, if when, you, when you take the text out of the context, all you're left with is a con. Yeah. So I love that. Well, I wish I made that up, but I didn't. Yeah. Make that up. <laughs> so, like anything, you need to read it all in context and understand what Isaiah is trying to say. That's right. You know. All right. I know you're gonna like this one. Psalm fifty-one, eighteen. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else would I give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good will to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. One more. Then, wait. Then shall you be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bulls upon your altar. So what precedes it? Right. The good will exactly. to Zion. Mm -hmm. So the, what precedes it? It's the broken spirit and a contrite heart. If I can pause, if I can pause you for one second, I want to ask you a question. You just mentioned what precedes what precedes a yep. sacrifice and an offering being accepted, and you mentioned the broken and contrite heart. Right there, spirit. Um, if I can ask you though, this is David speaking. Did David have a temple? No. Did he have for a tabernacle? Build one. For building yeah, a tabernacle, build but he really wanted to build one, which means he definitely thought it was important, right? Yeah, but if you read the text, why was it? Why did 
why did David think it was important to God? Because mm. God needed a home, because people sure. need the tangible, sure. of the, the uh, you know, the, the stories David would have heard, because remember, he's well after the, the, uh, the, the taking the promised land. Definitely. Okay? The stories mm -hmm. he would have heard is about the cloud that wandered with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. The stories he would have heard is the pillar of fire. The stories he would have heard would have been the miracles that God did for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he says uh, about the, uh, the, the uh, portable uh, Mishkan, the, uh, yep, the tabernacle, yeah. tabernacle. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, is this fitting for God? <laughs> you know, and look, there's a human desire of course that we that we want our religious mm -hmm. institutions to look good yeah definitely we, we don't want to we don't want the sanctuary whatever church mosque synagogue whatever we go to temple we go to we don't we don't want it to look like like a like a we want it to look nice yeah yeah so he, he's not thinking you know they need to have a sacrifice they need to have an altar what he's thinking of is god needs the true respect that's due him by yep. having a nice place to go to. Sure, sure. Home, a house. But at the same time, they had that. They did have the sanctuary. They had the Mishkan. And right. in the time of his son, they had the Mikdash, etc. But David is still saying, listen, like you can have all that. You can bring these offerings and all that. But if you right. don't have the broken heart and the broken spirit, the right. repentant heart, none of it that matters. You no good. Right. So you know, when, when people say that, oh, well, you have no temple, what can you do? He had a temple and he said, this is what you had to do. And, right? and that only, that question only comes from people who think that the only way you can get forgiveness is a blood sacrifice. Blood. Exactly. The Bible, the Bible never said you have to have a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin, but that's not exactly our topic for tonight. Now we're so going to hear, the, by the way, do you, know, a bit. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I call, uh, the the uh, Mishkan, the tabernacle that wandered with the Jews in the wilderness. Oh, let's hear it. Let's hear it, Dad. <laughs> God's Winnebago. <laughs> oh boy, did well, it have a? It, it was the home of God, where his 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 presence dwelt, so mm -hmm. to speak, so to speak. Okay, and it wandered around with them. So Winnebago. <laughs> it's an RV. <laughs> All right. So Proverbs 15, verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the eternal, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Why is the sacrifice of the wicked an abomination? Because the whole point, as we, as I said before, it needs to be that sign, right? That physical sign of the penitent heart. And right. if you're bringing the physical without the inward change, that's right. abominable. And, and therefore, the sacrifice hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed yeah. is the attitude. Therefore, the penitent heart is what makes you righteous. Exactly. And the penitent heart is the is what's paramount. Right, and that's why you're wicked. If you, you haven't should... repented, you're still on the wicked side of things. Right. If, right. You, and and what good is repentance if, if you're going to do it again? Exactly. Exactly. So, so the the uh, the issue here is the change in the person not the sacrifice it's not really the sacrifice that gets you forgiveness and this is solomon this is he built the temple right you know and, and and the temple that he built is the same place where all the sacrifices had to be offered exactly right yep. um well, well we'll probably get to it okay uh proverbs 21 27 the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination how much more when he brings it with evil intent, what what intent that's evil? No, what evil intent would there be if he brings a sacrifice? Hmm. Fooling God, bribing God, bribing that, God. That was a very big, you know, like when we study, yeah, but Greek and Roman and polytheism and how they brought offerings. Yes. It was to bribe their gods, right? To so appease then, the gods. Yeah, right. So do you think that's the context of what he means by evil intent? Uh, uh, a, a manner I, I of think, bribery or? Well, here's what I think. Okay. And Steve, you'll get that from people today. I'm not saying it's gone away and doesn't exist, even in the Jewish community. Um, 
look how great I am because I'm giving all this big stuff to the to the church I go to. Look, oh. look at how wonderful I am because I'm giving to the synagogue. Put my name up in lights. Mm. Okay. Look, as I we said five minutes ago, okay, a lot of times Judaism really doesn't care about the motivation. They care about the effect of what you're doing. Get right. get the money to the poor. Yeah. Okay. But it's Judaism isn't exactly going to be happy when somebody is just patting themselves on the back for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a balance between between the two. Okay, it depends on what the circumstances and everything else is going on. But um, I, when it says wicked intent there, what I think it really means is, you know, the the ulterior motives, sure. let's put it that way, the ulterior okay. motives that people can have. But even when they do the right thing, okay, even the people for whom they do it really don't care what their, their intent is or what their, their ulterior motives are, okay? But God knows our hearts. Yeah, right. For sure. and, and God would prefer our hearts go along with our pocketbooks. Right. And these next these next citations, there's 28, 4, 9, and there's one more. I included these because these actually show just how important the commandments are in right. the mixture of all this. Right. So I and I think that this proverb is incredibly vital even today. Sure. Proverbs 28, 4, those who forsake the Torah praise the wicked, but those who keep the Torah strive with them. Yep. You know, it's not enough to just be passive. Let's hold hands and sing kumbaya. <laughs> but when you, when you see somebody doing something wrong, rebuke your neighbor. Right, right. You'll be held culpable for his sin. Sure, of course. That's a loose translation, but from Leviticus. Okay, those who forsake the Torah praise the wicked, but those who keep the Torah strive with those who are wicked. Yep. He who turns away his ear from hearing the Torah, even his prayer shall be abomination. Because mm. it's, look, a lot of the commandments, let, let me rephrase that, it's not a lot. There are commandments that we, are no, that we know about that are really commandments in the Ten Commandments about hypocrisy. Yep. Okay mistranslation one of the i call the ten commandments the most misunderstood mistranslated collection of verses in the bible <laughs> sure okay lotisa et shem hashem lashav it doesn't say it does not say don't take the name of the lord your god in vain what it says is is don't lift up the name of the eternal your god in vain what does it mean to lift up the name of god Okay, to show yourself as religious. Sure, don't be a hypocrite. Yeah, that's the point. It's actually against hypocrisy, not against bad speech. Although people can use bad speech and be a hypocrite. Oh yeah, it. sure. I think I okay. think there could be a lot of ways that that all ties in together. But yeah, I think you have a brilliant point there for sure. It, well, it, it, it's 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 embedded in the Hebrew. Lotisa means to lift up. And people I mean, if, say, if well, you were to if you were to see a a fella. <laughs> Walking down the street with Payas and he just up and murders somebody. That's taking the name of yeah, the my example. My example is is less dramatic. It's like seeing somebody with a yarmulke on, okay, who goes in and robs a bank. Yeah, yeah, same. Or it's somebody, or it's somebody right? who wears a cross around their neck and goes in and robs a bank. Right. right. They show themselves by the yarmulke or by the cross or whatever that they're they're religious, and then they and then they violate what their religion teaches them exactly and, and why That's, then yeah, does it say point. why then does it say in the ten commandments you know uh because god will not hold guiltless a person who lifts up the name of god in vain because god cannot afford to have hypocrites out there sure when jimmy i mean it's uh, it's comparable to when you jimmy, see like it's comparable like to when you see uh abraham pray or something like that for example um when he's talking about destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, and Abraham says, "Like, what will the nation say about you? Like, will the just God right. not do justly?" Right? Yeah, right. Um, what are other people going to say about you, God, if this is what happens? Right. Exactly. And 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 hypocrisy not only hits, not only damages the reputation of the person, 
It also damages the reputation of the religion. It also damages the relationship. I'm sorry, damages the reputation of God. Right. And you can actually see that practically oh. in um, the history of the church. They've destroyed their reputation for all the violence and horrible things they've done for the and, last. And, 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 and it's not even it's not even that far back. Sure. Okay. Or maybe you're too young to remember this, Steve. But when Jim Baker or Jimmy, uh, Jim Baker and Jimmy, I can't think of his name, Oklahoma City, uh, I uh, can't remember his name. When they were caught doing something bad, okay, it not only shined a bad light on their Protestant denomination, yeah. it also shined a bad light on all people who are religious and sure. on the God or gods that we worship. Because when, and that's why God cannot hold guiltless someone who is, is a hypocrite regarding yeah. God. Profanes his name. Yeah, for sure. Profanes his name. Right. So, and what's the next one? Four, nine, and what? Thirteen. Thirteen. He who covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. And where in there does it say anything about a blood sacrifice? No, nowhere. <laughs> exactly. Covers his it sins makes, shall it not It makes prosper. me wonder if, I didn't read this in Hebrew, but it makes me wonder if he who covers his sins is actually talking about a blood sacrifice. Makes me wonder if that's what it's talking about. Well, you could interpret it that way, but cover of sins usually means try to hide what he did. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. You think there could be a double meaning, like kapara, atonement? Oh, it could could be. It could be, absolutely. Uh, Which goes back to the previous line, so maybe you're more accurate than than I thought. You know what I mean? Like you you try to bring that offering to cover your sin with no one knowing about it, thinking you can pull one over on God, you know? But really what matters is confessing and being, you know, turning away from your wicked way, right? Absolutely, and that's the whole. That's kind of just how I read it, and maybe I'm wrong, but. Well, I I think that's a legitimate interpretation of it. Okay. Because it's hypocrisy. Sure. You know, look at me. I'm giving up a a a cow, or a bull, or whatever. But internally, they haven't changed. Right. All right. Now I get to First Kings eight. This to me is so incredibly important. First Kings is about the speech yep. that Solomon made. The first uh, Hanukkah, right? <laughs> uh, when, yes. When he's dedicating the house of God, when he's dedicating the temple, the only temple on the entire planet, mm-hmm. he's dedicating the temple to God. Yep. And what does he say about it? And also concerning a stranger who is not of your people, Israel, but comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and of your strong hand and of your stretched out arm. When he shall come and pray toward this house, hear you in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calls to you for, that all people of the earth may know your name to fear you as do your people, Israel, and that they may know that this house, which I have built, is called by your name. I included that because it shows that even in those days, and Christians never never admit this, non-Jews could equally have a relationship with God. And that relationship is not based on a blood sacrifice. But it's based on praying, exactly. It's, and, and changing your ways. Changing your ways, right. Okay. And now we right. have 47. Right. Yet if they take thought in the land where they were... I skipped a few verses. This is after. Oh, no, there's important. Okay. Well, okay. All right. Yet if they take thought in the land, who who's it talking about now in 47? He's talking about the Jews now, the children of four, Israel. Yeah. Four verses later. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let, we need to make that clear that verses were skipped. And it's now talking not about the stranger who comes from a faraway land. Now it's talking about the, the, the Israelites themselves. Yep. Mm-hmm. The people of Israel. Yet if they, the people of Israel, take thought in the land where they were carried captive, their enemies won a war and carried them captive, and they repent and make supplication to you in the land of those that carried them captive. So before you move forward, okay, they're thinking about what they've done. Mm -hmm. They repent of their sins. 
They make supplication, which means pray to God yep. in the land of their enemies. Mm -hmm. And what is that prayer to include? Okay, now move up. We have sinned. We've done perversely. We have committed wickedness. And by the way, if you lift this up and put it in the High Holiday Prayer Book, you will see that this is exactly what we Jews recite for the holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Wow. And so return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who led them away captive and pray to you toward their land, which you gave their fathers, toward the city which you have chosen, toward the house which I have built for your name. Why do our synagogues always face, if they're in the West, they face East? Face Why? Jerusalem. They face always the face Jerusalem. When you get closer to Jerusalem, they always face the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's how they're supposed to work. When God, this is 49, then hear you, that's God, their prayer and their supplication in heaven, your dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions where they have transgressed against you, and give them compassion for those who carry them captive, that they may have compassion on them. What is this saying? It is saying, it's clear, you don't have to interpret it, it's, it's literal, yep. that if you stop doing the bad, start doing the good, repent of what you've done, and, and, and pray for forgiveness, God forgives you. And, and, right. and remember, right. Right. and this mm -hmm. is important to reiterate, because I know we said this, this is at the dedication ceremony of the very place that the sacrifices are going to be offered to God. And here, Solomon the Wise is yep. saying, mm -hmm. we don't need this place. Yep. I mean, we he's just read all those proverbs he's where he says this exact same thing. Mm -hmm. He's dedicating the place where the sacrifices are going to occur. And he says, we don't need this place or the sacrifices. Because <laughs> when you're anywhere else in the land of your enemy and you face this place, Stop doing the bad, start doing the good, repent, pray, you're forgiven. And it's funny because do you want to know how Michael Brown responds to this? How? I'm you're afraid to ask. You're going to laugh. It's just, it's so stupid. He says, um, 1 Kings 8 is only binding if there's still a temple standing whilst you're in exile. Tell me how stupid of an argument that is. Wait. And when I heard that, when I heard that, OK, because they're in um, they're in verse 48. You see how it says uh, and the house which I have built for your name. It implies that the temple is still standing. <laughs> Tell me how stupid of a response that is. Well, first of all, when Jesus was alive, the temple still stood. Right. So any sacrifice that took place, blood sacrifice that, that, that took place according to his own words, would be irrelevant because it was during the period the temple stood. Yeah. It's... Right, na right now, Steve, can I say that because an ancestor of mine made a sacrifice 200 years ago, that should work for me? <laughs> no. Clearly not. And yet that's what Michael Brown would be saying, that exactly. Exactly. Jesus' sacrifice for the whole world occurred when the temple was still standing, and therefore, it's it, it, you're right. It's it's really, it's really ridiculous. And um, to assume that the Jews would be carried off and into exile, uh, and the temple still stand. That's I mean, that's kind of strange. We have two major exiles of the right. nation, and the and, and the exile they're carried normally off. goes along with the destruction of the temple. But okay, let's. I tell you what, let's concede it. Let's concede his point and see what the Bible has to say about it in Daniel. And, and, and wait, remember something. Go back to that. 48 verse okay mm -hmm. return to you with all their heart with all their soul in the land of their enemies so there's already carried away yeah okay the mm -hmm. temple has already been destroyed with the exiles like, like you're talking about we let them away captive and pray to you toward their land towards the city towards the house the house is not standing it's already been destroyed or else they wouldn't be in exile right he seems his, so, his point is to assume otherwise that the, ho the house can you... stand and you be in exile. I disagree. But yeah, so do I. So does the text. So does the text. Yeah. And we actually see the practice of this in Daniel in the absence of a temple. Right. Because Daniel was already in exile. 
Daniel 6, 11. Now, when Daniel learned that the writing was signed, he went into his house. His windows were open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. And he kneeled upon his knees three times a day. How often did Jews pray? Three times a day. Mm -hmm. And prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So clearly the temple's been destroyed. And he's following exactly what Isaiah said to do. Yeah, exactly what Solomon said to do about... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. What? Yes, that's what I meant. What yeah. Solomon said to do. Facing the city and praying. Yeah. It's... Right. Solomon. I, I said, <laughs> yeah. So I'm sorry, Michael Brown, but Daniel didn't really care about what you had to say. <laughs> All right. Second, you know something? I love this passage. Me too. One of my favorites, actually. God forbid. God forbid the next time there is a major catastrophe mm. <laughs> god forbid a hurricane hits tornado rips through a town okay whatever it is you're gonna see christians put up this 14th verse oh yeah Big as, a, as a way to accuse the people who were victims of being guilty and needing the calamity that befell them yep so christians are putting this up but let's read it We'll begin with Second Chronicles 7, 13, but they put up 14. If I shut up heaven so that there should be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and pause. seek my... Pause before you go on. Go Which ahead. nation is called by the name of God? Yisrael, Israel. Exactly. So it says, if my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. This is what Christians put up to accuse and, and blame the victim. Mm -hmm. But tell me something. Where in Second Chronicles 7.14 does it say anything for forgiving their sin by having any kind of sacrifice? Blood Nowhere. sacrifice. Nowhere. And contextually, this occurs, Second Chronicles 7, or 6, 6 and 7, actually runs parallel with First Kings 8, what we just read. Okay. Uh, and this part right here is after the dedication speech is over, and God starts talking to Solomon and says, tell the people this. And what's it say? It says, if I feel the need to punish you while this temple stands, right, what are you supposed to do? Pray. Seek my face. Humble yourselves. Right. Stop doing the bad. Start doing the good. Yeah, it's called <laughs> repentance. Exactly. <laughs> right. And the temple stands. That's that's a major but, point, is the temple standing when he's saying this. But how could he say this if he believed that you have to have a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin? He he couldn't say this if he believed you had to have a blood, you had to have a blood sacrifice. And what's even more important is that it's God speaking. So if God believed you needed to have a blood sacrifice that he would have to send himself to die, he could have never said this. Right. It's God speaking contextually. Right. So God tells this to Solomon to tell the people just to go completely against what he already said. Right. Exactly. That's enough, right. Right. And when Solomon did the previous verses... If Solomon didn't understand that you don't need a blood sacrifice, he wouldn't have said what he said. Exactly. Exactly. Neither would God, just like you said here. Okay. Isaiah 56, verse 7. Oh, okay. I don't know if you read verse 15 or not, but it basically just says... Uh, now my eyes shall be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. I think that's... Not to the blood important. sacrifice, but to exactly. the prayer. Right? Exactly. I think that part's really important. It is important. You're right. All right, and this is the last citation. Even them will I bring, I'm sorry, Isaiah 56, verse 7. Isaiah 56, verse 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. So it's talking about non-Jews. Yep. And um, what is the... If I can ask you a question here, what is the defining factor that causes the offerings to be accepted? Their change of heart. And their prayers. Yeah, of course. 
of course. And but, you can, but even if you offer the prayer, mm -hmm. if you don't have the change of heart, what does God say? Don't be a hypocrite. Sure, sure. You know? And so, I, I think across the board, Christians and Jews would all agree this is a prophecy of the third temple. So how could there be burnt offerings and sacrifices if Jesus did away with all that? By the way, this one last section of the verse, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, mm -hmm. does not mean that you can go to any synagogue and pray to a pagan idol. When wow. it says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples, it assumes that the prayers are still to the one true God, the God of the Jewish people. Of course. I mean, if this, if this Steve, contextually I'm telling you, is... I'm telling you, I've heard Christians say, oh, my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Well, that's true, but you're not praying to the right God. You're not praying to our God. You're not praying to God. <laughs> you're praying to your God with a small g. Exactly. Of course. And if... I mean, we understand contextually, like I said, that this is the final temple, the the messianic era, etc. That yep. means there'll be a worldwide knowledge of God. So all peoples will believe in one God, right. which means all those prayers will be going to the same, you know, knowledge in the same of God direction. Will cover the sea. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But that's um, a last citation, Rabbi. Is there anything else you have? Yes, I think. Uh, no, not really. We, I think we covered it well enough that it's should be clear to everybody. You don't need a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. Sure. Okay. If we really had to, we could go to Leviticus 17, 11, where Christians pretend it's, you know, it says that you have to have blood sacrifice. And you say, they always quote it, Stephen, when you say, well, what's the, what's 1710 about? What is 1712 about? They only quote 1711. What's the verse before or the verse after? And it's talking about drink the blood. We're not saying that blood sacrifices weren't one way to get forgiveness of God if you brought it with the repentant heart. Mm -hmm. But the blood wasn't supposed to go in your mouth. It's supposed to go on the ground, right. on the altar. Exactly. exactly. Okay? Mm -hmm. Actually, on the on the altar, on the sides of the altar, not on top of the altar, because that would put the fire out. <laughs> okay. uh, you and I, one on what we didn't include is from Hosea. Um, therefore, one? render the bulls of our lips. Oh, uh, 14. And contextually, and there, contextually there, Hosea is speaking to the northern kingdom, and there was a civil war going on, so they couldn't go down to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem, so Hosea says, "You know what? You know you can pray, right? Same yeah. thing over and over and over again." I I was listening to Rabbi Skoback not too long ago, and he says the Christian claim is normally always based upon one verse or one passage um and their whole claim stakes on that for example right. like isaiah 53 like their entire claim stakes on one chapter or one verse or something whereas throughout the entire hebrew bible you see congruent congruent teachings and congruent ideas when you take the text out of the context all you're left with is a con <laughs> that's right yep all right, good. Yeah, that was that was good, Rabbi. I hope uh, I hope this is clear. I hope we brought enough to the table to show that um, even with a temple, without a temple, it doesn't matter. It's the heart that matters. It's it's the repentant heart that matters. Right, the changed person. Yeah, yeah. And this, by the way, we're doing this on the heels of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the Ten Days of Awe, and before that, Rosh Hashanah, before that, the month of Elul, when mm -hmm. we're supposed to figure out what we did wrong and change our ways and not be right. that person anymore. Sure. Sure. Yep. Did I, um, Oh, another one would have been Jonah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. You know, course. what did the people of Nineveh do when they finally understood the, 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 the uh, warning of Jonah stop, stopped eating or drinking. We call that fasting. Mm -hmm. And what do we do on Yom Kippur all day? We fast. They cry mightily to God. What do we call that prayer, which we do the whole day. And then it says, maybe God will see, you know, will, will forgive us. And it says, and God saw their works. Yep. It, you know, oh, you can't be forgiven by God because of your works. Uh, excuse me, Jonah. <laughs> yeah. And God saw their works. What works? That they stopped doing the bad and started doing the good and God forgave them. Mm -hmm. well, there are plenty of, of verses in the Hebrew scriptures 
that contradict this Christian idea that you got to have a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. Oh yeah, of but, course. but it starts out with no human sacrifice, and this is something we forgot to say. If Christians believe you have to have a blood sacrifice, exactly what is it that died on the cross? Right. If it wasn't, if it was Jesus the God, because I keep saying, oh, he's man and God. Well, who did the dying? It's not the Jesus the God who did the dying. God, my God can't die. Sorry about yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it had the only thing you're left with is Jesus the human who did the dying. Which means the basis of Christian theology is human sacrifice, which God, as we showed, call is calls it an abomination and something he hates. Exactly. And we brought that up at the beginning that and, human and, and sacrifice is an abomination. There, right? There's another there's another verse where God says again about the pagan heathen idolaters of the of, of the promised land that it wouldn't even come into God's mind to demand of us to do a human sacrifice. Deuteronomy 18, eh? Uh I think it's a prophet, well, but I, I, right now I can't remember. I'll have to look it up. But but God says that it wouldn't even come into my mind to demand of you. Right. Right. I'm so, reminded of a of a passage in Micah, um, and it's along the it's along the lines of. I don't want to misspeak. I don't want to misrepresent it, but it's it's Micah's basically kind of like talking, uh, sarcastically almost. Like, um, would it matter if I brought a bull? Would it even matter if I brought my firstborn? Like talking like so sarcastically, like if I offered that, would it make any difference? You know, right. You know yeah, what I the mean? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Yeah. It's been told you, oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you only to do justice, love, mercy, exactly. and walk humbly with your God. You got it. You got it. Exactly. Somehow a blood sacrifice just isn't in that list. Right, right. <laughs> in fact, he kind of, What's funny, though, is how he kind of like makes fun of the human sacrifice, even being like comparable to if you're humble and right. just and merciful. Right. Over right. and over again, we see that the I demand mercy, not sacrifice. Right. Right. Great. Great. Yeah, there's a lot of verses in there. But hey, we wanted to keep it short for our listeners. <laughs> yeah. 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 <sighs> but no, sometimes. You know, you might be surprised by this, but a lot of my listeners message me and say that they uh, they prefer long shows. They like exhaustive. I'm yeah. stunned. They like exhaustive, long teachings. Oh, well, here's 300 more verses. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but all right, Rabbi, you got anything yep. left? Anything else you'd like to say? nothing i can think of offhand but as soon as we're off i'll think oh i wish i'd have said uh, this yeah, right. oh i should have said that yeah the only thing i can think of in closing is um you know you hear the line from christians all the time how do you jews get forgiveness without a temple we just we just oh, show God. we just show that with without it doesn't matter the penitent heart is what matters and never did it never did matter right you know blood sacrifice another thing we could have talked about is uh, Leviticus chapter four and following, okay? Uh, it says that a blood sacrifice only brought forgiveness if the sin was unintentional. Yep. If I commit first degree premeditated cold blooded murder, what? I give up a cow and God forgives me? <laughs> it, it's only a blood sacrifice only was only worked, okay? If the sin itself was accidental, was not on purpose. Sure. Which means that a blood sacrifice was the weakest form of finding forgiveness from God because other ways of finding forgiveness worked for all sin. Yep. Except, of course, the big three. Mm, of course. Murder, idolatry, or sexual sin. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yep. And those ones, those ones are, they're all around. They're Jew and non-Jew. So <laughs> you can't get around those. Unfortunate, but true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, considering how much time we spend, I'm some sometimes wondering if this is an idol. I, yeah, I tell you what, man. I tell you what. Yeah. It's definitely it's definitely a joy sucker, I can tell you that. And a time waster. Mm. And I'm just as guilty as the next person. Yeah. Uh, I agree. All right. I agree. Yep. But yep. everybody, Rabbi Stuart Federo, 
author of Judaism and Christianity, a contrast, as we said. Um, and re remember the Hebrew jumpstart, learn how to read Hebrew yes, in one yes. hour. Also Go linked in the description. Please, please, please check that out. Uh, and also, guys, me and Rabbi Federo might be uh, hooking up some ebooks for you guys in the near future. So, oh, we definitely will be on the See, lookout for those. I, I, I already wish I had that finished. I, something came up just today, and I'm thinking, God, I wish I could send you the website for this ebook. Whenever, whenever you can, man, take your time. Take your time. Yep. All right. But be on the lookout for that, everyone. Me and Rabbi got some good stuff coming down the pipe for you on a bunch of different topics. And, That's right. Uh, it'll be easily accessible, easily shareable, PDF format, ebook format, yep. you know. So just be on the lookout. But Rabbi, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you I always appreciate being so you, willing. Steve. To Thanks for the opportunity. Of course. Of course. Always willing to come on here and speak with us. Um, and, you know, we just have a conversation and go over what the book says, you know, so. That's all we have to do. It's all anybody has to do. Right, right. Pick up pick up the Bible and, you know, actually read it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's important. Yeah. But until next time, everybody, this was the Exodus Project. I'm Steve Eisenhower. We'll see you next time.